Heavenly Father, again, we just come before you. And Lord, we just pray that everything we've been through this past week, we could just lay at your feet so we can receive from you this morning. We pray that as we worship you, Lord, that you would be glorified and lifted up, that it would be pleasing in your sight. And Lord, those words that we sing unto you, may they minister to our heart and just draw us close to you, Father. Our desire is just to receive those words you have for us. And Father, as we look in Hebrews and look at the superiority of Jesus over all, because he's almighty God, just may that message be loud, may it be clear, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds. And as always, Lord, we just thank you for being our God. We thank you for your tremendous love for us. And Lord, we just give this morning into your hands that you would uh, use it to minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, everyone. And if we may open our Bibles this morning, uh, we're going to be reading from Psalm 75 this morning. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high, do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It's fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Amen. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1 as we're continuing our study through the book of Hebrews. And we're currently going just through the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 1, and we're taking our time because, to me, this is foundational to the rest of the book of Hebrews. Paul is establishing the superiority of Jesus, and these verses just are, are just powerful. We need to understand this. Uh, keep in mind that Paul's writing to Jewish Christians who were struggling with their faith, trying to go back to the old law, the old ways. And Paul is showing, he's establishing, look, Jesus is superior to all. Don't go back to that which is inferior. And so this is a powerful section here in the book of Hebrews, and really the whole book of Hebrews is showing that Jesus is superior to all because he is Almighty God. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this the last few weeks, you know, how God had spoken in times past to the prophets. And in many different ways he spoke to them. But then he says, but now God is speaking to us through Jesus, the Word of God. You see, the prophets didn't have the full revelation. When Jesus came, he's given us the full revelation. We see what this is all about. They had a glimpse of it. They didn't fully understand what this all meant. But here comes Jesus, and he lays it all out for us. And that's why Paul's saying, look, this is why we need to listen to Jesus. You know, we have so many people today that are listening to prophets and and all kinds of uh, apostles and all this stuff that's coming back into the church today, which, again, I don't think is foundational. I don't think it's biblical, because Paul said in Ephesians that, the apostles and prophets laid the foundation of the church. Now the church is being built upon that foundation. Why are we continuing on with this foundation? Why are there apostles and prophets being raised up today? It's beyond me. So Jesus is superior to all. And to show us, to prove this point, and basically in this first three verses, he's dealing with superior to these prophets. That's why we need to listen to Jesus as he gives us this sevenfold description of the Son of Jesus Christ. And he's, again, just showing the superiority of Jesus over these prophets. And then, as we move on in the next few weeks, we're going to see that Jesus is superior to the angels. Well, it, it makes sense. You know, Jesus is Almighty God. Man, the prophets were a created being. Angels are created beings. Jesus is eternal. So, of course, he's superior. 
Now, we started out looking at Jesus being superior to the prophets because he is heir of all things. He made the worlds. He not only made the worlds, but even the ages we live in are in his hands. And that, this morning we're going to deal with a few more descriptions of Jesus. And again, keep in mind this basic point. And I know I keep driving this home, but we, there's so many people today that are claiming special revelations from God and all this. And Paul's saying, listen to Jesus. He's the final authority. And thus, listen to his word. Uh, so he's superior to all. So let's pick up Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1, where Paul wrote, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, Paul just wants them to totally understand. Don't go back to what man is saying. I mean, yeah, the prophets gave us part of it, but now we've got the full revelation. We have Jesus. We need to listen to what he's telling us. We need to pay attention to what he's saying. And we're going to pick up, we're going to look at this third point, or third description of Jesus, showing that he's superior to the prophets. And it's found in verse 3, the first part. And we're told that Jesus, who being the brightness of of his glory. This is speaking about Jesus radiating the glory of God the Father because he's superior to the prophets. Of course, it just makes sense. Now here's the problem. We even see this today. There's a problem in the early church. It's a problem today. They see Jesus as being inferior to God the Father. Think of it like this. This is the rationale. If Jesus is just a reflection of God the Father, then it's God the Father who is shining and not Jesus. In other words, the moon doesn't shine its own light, but it's a reflection of the light of the sun. The sun is the source and the moon is reflecting the light. So in their thinking, they believe that Jesus is just reflecting the light of God the Father, which then makes him inferior to God the Father. This is important. And it, you know, we'll, we'll begin clearing this up, hopefully, for you. Uh, in this description of Jesus, but if not in this one, definitely in the next description, it's abundantly clear unless you have preconceived ideas about who Jesus is, when there's many people who do. And they won't get beyond what the, they won't look at what the scriptures say because of the traditions that they've been taught, they'll hold on to them. And I realize it's kind of hard, you know, we're trying to understand God who uh, is an all-knowing God and describe them in earthly terms. And we don't know, we, we miss it sometimes. And I think, you know, people take things out of context. They don't read what the scriptures are really saying. They, they make their point to prove their point. This is, look at what it says here. But they don't read what it really says. I'll give you an example, and I shared, with this, I shared this with you before, but Leviticus 13.40, I know you guys are like, oh my gosh, Leviticus again. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying. This is the verse. As for the man whose hair has fallen from his head, he is bald, but he is clean. Now, I could take that verse, and I can easily come to the conclusion that bald people are clean. And so after service this morning, we are going to have the barbers come out. We're going to shave everyone's head. You ladies, too, don't smile. You're getting your head shaved, because then you will be clean. Now, some of you guys are doing good already, because your hair has fallen out, and you're already clean. We don't have to worry. Now, we laugh at that. We think that's crazy. But people take things out of context all the time. They don't read what it's saying. You see, look at what it says before that verse and after that verse. It's a verse that's dealing with leprosy. And if you were just bald, you don't have leprosy. You just lost your hair. And so you're clean, not from sin, but from leprosy. You have. To, that's how important it is. You know, we've got... I just... Uh, read an article, I think Cindy sent it uh, to me, about this new thing that's been going on, I think, for a year or so, maybe longer. It's called um, uh, soul-sucking, I think it's called. Okay, let me explain, because this is, this is what's going on. 
you find some godly man or woman who has died and you go to their grave and you lay on the ground and you absorb their energy or whatever. We laugh at that, but people are doing it. Christians are doing that. Why? Well, I, I have to read more into this, but I really think it probably has a lot to do with Elisha when uh, he was in the tomb and uh, they dropped a dead body into, in with him and he came to life. But it has nothing to do with what's going on today. But again, you know, we don't need a lot to come up with this stuff. Another issue that I had to deal with a few months back, I had this gentleman call me and he, this was a few months ago, and he asked me if he could ask a question. I said, sure. And I was really being set up for an onslaught. You know, I, I, sometimes I'm so naive, you know, I'm just like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And I, you know, there should have been red flags going up all over the place, and, and I was just didn't see them right away. Now, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what verse he was using to prove his point, because uh, he wasn't really asking me a question, he was trying to prove a point. But it had to do with the deity of Jesus. And he, read all my, he read, said he read the studies that were online, and he disagrees. And he took, I think it was John 5.44, I could be wrong, but it says, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? And he said, see, there's only one God. Right? How do you explain that? And it's true, there is only one God. Manifested in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But if you were to take that verse alone, what conclusion could you come to? That there is only one God. And maybe Jesus isn't God. Do you see how dangerous it is to take one verse and come up with your own doctrine? And I tried to show in the scriptures that Jesus is God, and he was angry at me. And he was yelling at me. And he goes, I'm at work. And, you know, I'm like, whatever. And he goes, I know Hebrew and Greek. I think he was just telling me that he was smarter than me, which was probably true, you know. Most people are smarter than me. I don't have a problem with that. I know my God is smarter than everyone, so I just rest in him. The main issue is what the Word of God says. In, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, it says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's a picture of the Trinity. Yes, the word Trinity is not in the scriptures, but we see the picture. One God manifested in three distinct persons. Jesus, the Son of God, or heir of God. We see God the Father speak, and we see the Holy, God the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. And again, in a few weeks, if that's not enough, I mean, in a few weeks, we have God the Father in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, say to the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Is that pretty clear? You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to understand that. But again... I'm not sure why I stayed on the line that long, because he was just yelling and screaming at me, and I, every time I tried to answer, he, he was just yelling at me. And I, I, there was a point where it's like, this is it, I'm just going to end this conversation, because there's no point. I mean, he didn't have a question, he just wanted an argument, and I wasn't going to go any farther. And in the middle of the sentence, the line went dead. I don't know what happened. He was at work, and I'm sure everyone at work, probably in the businesses across the street, heard him. That's how loud he was. But again, he was basing it on his feelings, not what the scriptures say. Yes, he was taking that one scripture, only one God. Absolutely. That's what we believe. One God manifested in three distinct persons. You see how important it is to look at the totality of the scriptures and not make a doctrine based on one verse. You have to take things into context. And so, what we read here in Hebrews is that Jesus is radiating the light of God the Father, but we need to look at that point in the light of the rest of the scriptures because we can easily come to unbiblical conclusions. The word 
Brightness used here speaks of radiance. And the idea is that of Jesus is expressing or flashing forth the glory and majesty of the triune God. It's not that he's just reflecting the glory of God, not at all. It's far beyond that. He possesses the glory of God because he is God. And what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is the glory of God, and we need to keep in mind that Paul is writing to Jewish believers. And when they think about the glory of God, what do you think they're thinking about? The Shekinah glory, the presence of God. In, in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We see humanity added to deity in Jesus. That God became flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. And in the body of flesh he remained fully God, and the glory of the Father was manifested through Jesus. Now, what is God the Father like? Well, in John 6, 46, Jesus said, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. You know, Jesus is telling us that no one has seen God the Father except one. Him. Jesus is the only one who's seen the Father. So he knows exactly what the Father is like. So then how do we know what God the Father is about? John 14, verses 9 through 11. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. But believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You see, no man has seen God the Father, thus we can get a picture of what the Father is about by looking at Jesus. And we'll see this more as we look at this description of Jesus here in chapter 1 of Hebrews. It's not just that he reflects the glory of God the Father. He is part of that glory. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And Mark tells us the same thing, except he says when he was transfigured before them, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. I love that. You know, I like that little part. It doesn't matter. You can't get it any whiter than that. His, he was just radiating in this pure whiteness. And Luke says in Luke 9, 29, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. You know, this is speaking of Jesus appearing before these three men in all of his glory. The glory that he had before he became flesh and dwelt among us. The glory that he laid aside in the incarnation. And it wasn't that the glory was gone. It was veiled in flesh. But here on the Mount of Transfiguration, we see clearly this glory. Now, this word transfigured, uh, dealing with the, uh, here in Matthew and Mark and Luke, with this transfiguration, it's, it's a word that means change in form, to change appearance from within. We get our English word metamorphosis from. Think about, you know, the caterpillar changing into a butterfly. That's the idea with this word. You know, when he did that, his, you know, we're, we're told that the face of Jesus shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. That's amazing. I mean, that, you know, if that's why Peter wanted to stay up there. Hey, why go anywhere? Let's set up, you know, a couple booths here and just stay here. We don't have to go down from this mountain. They were with the Lord. But now this glory is veiled in the flesh. But it's been revealed to these men. And, you know, Think about the kingdom age. What are we going to see? How are we going to see Jesus in all of his glory? Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Then why didn't so many people not see Jesus as the Messiah, as God incarnate? Why do people still struggle with that today? 
Well, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 explains it. He says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You see that? There is the problem. Their eyes have been blinded. I mean, do you see what happened in, in Ireland? First nation to accept homosexuality, gay marriage. And f the news media was just amazed because this was a conservative nation. This wasn't a liberal nation. Very Catholic nation. And yet, they got more votes to pass this agenda, which is agenda. The God of this age has blinded their eyes. And you look at our nation. We see a nation that calls good evil and evil good. Don't you scratch your heads? And I'm not saying, guys, you know, you'll even look at all the police incidents. And I'm not saying every police officer is perfect because there are no perfect people. Some do make mistakes. Some cross the line. But in the reports that you hear, and not always on our news media, most of the time these police officers are chasing bad guys and they get killed. And what, is the, what do we say? We, the news media always says, unarmed man. Not that he just robbed a store, tried to get the police officer's gun or whatever. Unarmed man. And we, we exalt the evil and the good we put down. You think, how much worse can it get? Don't ask that question. <laughs> I said that 20 years ago, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have never asked that because it's worse today. But the key is, we're the light, and we're the salt. We're the preserving force, and we are to shine during this time. You know, it wasn't very good during Paul's day either. So don't lose sight of that. He's still on the throne. And for those that do believe, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul said, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This glory is seen in Jesus. And, you know, again, for the Jew, which Paul is really writing to, their minds are thinking of the Shekinah glory. Remember, it was the pillar of fire uh, by night and the cloud by day that guided the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings as they left Egypt. We see that in Exodus 13. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Then the tabernacle, that portable worship structure in the wilderness. We see the glory of God, the Shekinah glory filling the Holy of Holies. And then when Solomon built the temple, as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies in 1 Kings chapter 8, we're told, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You see, they were eyewitnesses to the glory of God. His presence filled their lives until they turned from Him. The children of Israel rebelled, they refused to repent and get right with God. God was very gracious and merciful. He was patient. But there came a point where they refused to turn, and God says, you're going into captivity. And before they went into captivity, do you remember what happened? It was a significant thing. The presence of God left the temple, left the Holy of Holies. We read about that in Ezekiel. The Lord began to leave. He came out of the Holy of Holies, went out the East Gate, then over the Mount of Olives. And for several hundred years, even though the temple would be rebuilt, the glory of God would not fill it. His presence wasn't there. It was an empty shell. That was until one day. In the town of Bethlehem, Jesus was born. You see, 
the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the glory of God was present with the people, and they didn't even see it. Yes, it was veiled in flesh, but they had so much information, which we're going to talk about, that Jesus is the one the prophets spoke of. He is their Messiah. The glory of God was with them. The Shekinah glory. So, make no mistake about it. Jesus is superior to the prophets. He is the brightness of his glory. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the next point we're going to look at, number four, is that he is the express image of his person. That's why we need to listen to Jesus. He's the exact likeness to God the Father. People don't see this as really important today, but this is, to me is without a doubt vital to our faith. Is Jesus God? And of course, yes. No doubt. Not because I say so. It's because what the scriptures say. And, and too often people go, but I feel. What does that mean? Can you be wrong? Can your feelings be wrong? Absolutely. I remember as a kid, every school year, I had a feeling, I'm going to get an A. I'm going to get an A. It didn't happen. But I really felt I did. I really felt I was going to get one, but it didn't happen until I got to college. But that's a different story. Let me just share a couple of Bible versions that translate this thought about the express image of his person. That's from the New King James. The New International, the exact representation of his nature. American standard, the very image of his substance. Today's English, the exact likeness of God's own being. The complete Jewish Bible, the very expression of God's essence. If that doesn't do it for you, the Greek word for express image is character. It's a word used like of an engraver, or one who mints coins, a, a graving tool, a die, a stamp, a branding iron, a mark engraved, an impress, a stamp on coins and seals. It's an exact representation. He's the exact imp image of God the Father in his essence or core, his attributes and his character. Jesus exactly represents God to us because Jesus is God. It's like a stamp. You want to see what Jesus is, or what the Father's like, you look to Jesus. In Colossians 2.9, Paul said, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Well, what does that mean? It means all that God is, God the Father, God the Spirit, it's all found in Jesus. We could see what God is like because Jesus is an exact, exact representation of him because Jesus is God. Turn over to John for a second, chapter 10. And we're going to pick up reading in verse 22 of John chapter 10. I, I want to show you what the scriptures have to say about Jesus being God. And if you really miss the point, the Jews got the point, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. But in John chapter 10, starting in verse 22, it said, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my, of my sheep, as I, have, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jew, or Let's stop there for a minute, and I'll pick up on that other one. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's four months to, from the cross. He's been ministering for almost three years now, right? And we're told that it's the Feast of Dedication, which is interesting because this isn't a feast that we read about in the Old Testament. In fact, all the feasts were either in 
the spring, summer, or fall. There was no winter feast. So what is this feast of dedication? Well, it's also known as the Feast of Lights, or Hanukkah. It began on the 25th of Kislev, and that could be anywhere from November to December, December depending on the lunar cycle. And it's a com commemoration of the rededication of the temple by Mac the Maccabees in 165 BC. Remember, the temple was de desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes several years earlier. And the Maccabees put up a revolt. And as the story goes, when they began to light the lamps of the temple, now that they had it in their possession, the seven-branched oil-burning lamp only had enough oil to last one day. And it would take several days to make this pure oil for the lamps. You know, you couldn't go to Piggly Wiggly and get this oil. This was a special oil, and it was a special way to make it. It was for the Lord. And here's the problem. Once these lamps were lit, they were never to go out. But a miracle took place, and the lamps burned for eight days, and thus they celebrated this feast as a memorial of that day, the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. And here's Jesus. He's in this area. He's surrounded by the Jews. They closed them in, pinned them in, you might say. Why? Were they coming to seek the truth? I don't think so. How do I know that? Because they ask him a question, which I find amazing. Again, keep in mind, three years in the ministry. How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. What? What are you talking about, tell us plainly? He, he's raised the dead. He's healed the sick. He's opened the eyes of the blind, opened the ears of the deaf. He's touched the leopard and healed him. How much more do you need? This is what the Old Testament prophets said regarding the Messiah. How do I know that? Because the Old Testament tells us. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. His works were the evidence of who he is. Remember when John the Baptist was put in prison? John thought things were going wrong here, and he tells his disciples, go and ask Jesus, are you the one, or should we be looking for another? And, you know, again, John thought, kingdom, you know, the king's here, we're going to have a kingdom, put down all this rebellion, and things weren't going well because he's in prison. So go ask him, are you the guy we're looking for, or is there someone else we should be looking for? And what does Jesus do? He starts healing those that are sick. And then he tells the disciples of John, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. In other words, Jesus is saying, Hey, go tell John that what the Old Testament prophets were speaking of are fulfilled in me. I'm doing what they spoke of. I am the Messiah. Now, for these Jews listening to Jesus, he rebukes them. And he says, you guys don't follow me because you're not my sheep. You don't hear my voice because you don't believe. And I love the promise he gives. He goes, you know, if you are mine, no one's going to snatch you out of my hand. And we're in the Father's hand. If Jesus is in God, what kind of a promise is that? Can he protect us in his hand? Well, if he's not God, he can't. But if he is, he surely can. And we've got a double, uh, a double promise that we're in the Father's hand too. We're tight in him. No one's going to be able to snatch us. Not one. I love that. Now, verse 30 is kind of the pinnacle at the top of the mountain here. Because for all those who try and deny the deity of Jesus, I think it blows them out of the water. I and my Father are one. And the word that Jesus used here for one in the Greek is hen. And it doesn't suggest that the Father and the Son are the same identical person. It speaks of them being one in essence. The Father is God, the Son is God. You know, there are some who say that, you know, at one point... God is God the Father. But then he becomes Jesus. Oh, then he's the Holy Spirit. Then he's back to Jesus. No, that's not what the Scriptures teach. 
one God manifested in three distinct persons. He's speaking of unity, not identity. And Jesus could say this because he, was, he is God. And some think, well, maybe you're making too much of this, that I'm going overboard trying to prove that Jesus is God from this verse. Here's the thing. You don't have to know Greek. Not at all. Because the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying. How do I know that? Well, again, in John chapter 10, look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Verse 31 just amazes me. They took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> this was kind of a common practice, it seemed, for the Jews. They didn't like what Jesus was saying, and, you know, let's get rid of them. And the way this is written, it's not that Jesus just said this one time. This was the common way he taught, that he is God. And that's why the Jews were so upset. He, he's just a man. He's flesh and blood. How could he be God? In fact, the Amplified Bible puts verse 33, The Jews replied, We are not going to stone you for a good act, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, make yourself out to be God. Now, picking up stones to stone him, why would they do that? Because he was blaspheming God. If He, being a man, was making himself equal with God. And that was the punishment. The problem was Jesus is God. <laughs> you see, and the Jews understood exactly what Jesus was saying. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses and other cults try and deny the deity of Jesus, but the Jews were honest. And I'm not sure how anyone could say that Jesus never claimed to be God. I don't get it. They say, you know, his followers and others made him to be a God, but he really isn't. These are Christ's own words. That he and the Father are one, that they are God. One God manifested really in three distinct persons. And all you could say is that either what Jesus has said is true, or he's a liar. And the only reason you'll say he's a liar is because you don't agree with what he's saying. Now, these Jews had two choices to make here, to accept what Jesus was saying or to reject it. But they picked up stones. They rejected what Jesus was saying. Now, I know the Jehovah Witnesses don't call Jesus a liar, but they say that the Jews misunderstood what Jesus was saying, that he never claimed to be God. They just heard him wrong. Now, here's the thing, and I'm not sure if they think this through or not, but for me, I'm just being honest. If I'm out talking to people and they think that I claim to be God and now they're picking up stones to stone me, what's the first thing I'm going to do? Well, no, that's not what I said. I didn't say I was God. You misunderstood what I was talking about, right? But they don't think about this. They're just taught these things and they just, I guess, believe it. And what they say is, you know, because I, I ask them, I see, well, why didn't Jesus say, hey, look, I'm not. And they quote, like a lamb before a shearer is silent, so is Jesus. It sounds good, doesn't it? Until you look at how Jesus spoke to people. He condemned those that were wrong, that were teaching false doctrine. And don't you think that these Jews, if they believed he was God and he wasn't, he would have condemned them? Of course he did. He loved God's right. Why would he lead them down the wrong path? He wouldn't. He called the religious leaders brood of vipers. Not too silent there, huh? The Jews were at least honest about what Jesus said, that he was God, and that's why they're going to stone him to death. And again, this was in a one-time teaching. This was the focus of his ministry. This is what, who he, who, what he was about. He's telling people over and over again that he is God. 
Turn over to John for a minute, chapter 5. Jesus heals this paralytic man at the pool of Bethsaida. And we're going to pick up in verse 16. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 16. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. He will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, it's kind of interesting what they want to do with Jesus. Jesus heals this paralytic man, but it's on the Sabbath. I mean, you've got six other days to heal. Why do it on the Sabbath if they arrest? What's wrong with you, right? It's not a kosher thing to do. Now, if someone was bleeding to death, you could stop the bleeding. You could take care of critical issues, but you, know, you couldn't really clean them up and stuff. You had to wait till the Sabbath was over. And here Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath. And what do they want to do? They want to kill him. To me, that's hilarious. Jesus wants to heal, you want to kill. Right? It, it doesn't make sense. And if they would think this stuff through, but they didn't. Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. He was claiming to be God. And when people say Jesus never claimed to be God, well, you haven't read the scriptures. It's very clear. In fact, verse 19 and verse 25, Jesus uses these words, most assuredly or verily, verily. He's saying, pay attention. Listen carefully. Get this right. And I think they understood what he was saying because they're going to stone him. When Jesus says, if you don't love the Son, you don't love who? The Father. See, that probably irritated them even more. Because of course they loved the Father. They loved God the Father. But they couldn't accept the fact that Jesus is God. They were angry. And they want to put him to death. If Jesus isn't God then he couldn't pay the penalty for our sins. Is this a big issue? It absolutely is. Because man is sinful. Jesus is without sin. There is no spot or blemish in him. He is the kinsman redeemer who could purchase back that which was taken by Satan. In fact, this is such a serious issue that Jesus said in John 8, 24, Therefore I said to you if, that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, in your Bibles, it probably says, I am he. But the he's in italics because the he's not there. The, the translators put the he there for clarity. And they missed the point. Jesus said that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. If you do not believe that I am Almighty God, the voice of the burning bush from Exodus chapter 3, so is this important? Yeah, because if we get it wrong, we're going to die in our sins. It's very important. In fact, Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The word image speaks of a statue, a representation, the exact. Again, if you want to know what the Father is like, look at the Son. Look at Jesus. I like the way one writer put it. It kind of fits into the days we're living in today. He said, for example, to make a cassette copy of a record or CD, CD uh, always entailed a generational loss of quality. The cassette copy, although serviceable, never sounded quite as good as the original. 
Likewise, the copied recording onto videotape of a television program or film always lacked the viewing quality of the original broadcast. And we know that. For those of you who know what cassette tapes and 8-tracks are like, you know the quality of the cassette tape is not as good as the original. He goes on to say, however, those unfortunate analog days are behind us. Today, for example, every single copy of DVD being digital looks and sounds exactly the same. Any copy made at any time is absolutely indistinguishable from the original DVD master. Just so, we may think of Jesus as the digital Messiah, a perfect copy of his Father, alike in every way. It's not a great picture, but it makes sense. He's an exact representation of the Father. So when Jesus speaks, when we see him, when we read his word and see his character, his nature, his attributes, how he relates to people and so on, guess what? We see the Father because he is the express image of his person. He exactly represents God to us. So he, Jesus is superior to the prophets. He is the express image of his person. Well, lastly this morning, we're going to look at the next description of Jesus, <coughs> that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. You know, as children, we learn the song, you know, he's got the whole world in his hands, right? Well, it's even bigger than that. He's got the whole universe. He has everything in his hands. He not only created all things, he sustains all things. And the idea behind the word translated upholding uh, is more of maintaining. It's, it's God keeps everything in order. You know, that's what Paul said in Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The Amplified Bible says, And he himself existed before all things, and in him all things consist, cohere, and are held together. The Living Bible, he was before all else began, and it is, it, and it is his power that holds everything together. So he not only created all things into existence, he sustains them, he keeps them going. You know, there's this Calum's Law of Electricity that states, like charges repel each other. And the atom is made up of protons in its nucleus, and they are like charges. So they should repel each other, right? They should blow the atom apart, but they don't. Why? Scientists aren't sure. They've got speculations. One of the things that they say holds the atom together from exploding is atomic glue. It's pretty scientific. I know I don't want to go over your heads this morning with this scientific stuff, but atomic glue holds it all together. They don't know. They're guessing what's holding it all together. And you know, I was hoping to get the Nobel Prize in Science for the answer, because I have the answer. I know what holds everything together. It's Jesus. You think I'll get the Nobel Prize in Science? No, I don't think so. They don't like my answer, but that's the reality. Scientist A.K. Morrison tells us that the conditions for life to exist on the Earth demand billions of minute, interrelated circumstances occurring simultaneously, and if it didn't, life would be over. Yeah. Everything would... Our, imagine if God just let go. We, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, what happens. Think about it this way. If you were to take one tablespoon of positive charges and place them on the North Pole, and then take another tablespoon of positive charges and place them on the South Pole, remember, like charges repel each other, but we're pretty far apart. You know, the diameter between the poles, if you could cut right through the Earth, is 7,899.8 uh, miles apart. And so you got a tablespoon of positive charges on the North Pole, a tablespoon on the South Pole, and it would take 30,000 tons of pressure on each of the poles to keep them from pushing away from each other. Doesn't that blow your mind away when you think about that? What holds them together? It's not what, it's who. It's Jesus Christ. Turn over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Because we talk a lot about the Big Bang. And I, I think there is a Big Bang, but it hasn't happened yet. I think the Big Bang is coming. And this is what happens when Jesus lets go. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. 
The Lord is not, or, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is an explosion. That is a big bang, isn't it? There is going to be a big boom, but it's coming. And when Jesus lets go, this stuff is gone, and guess what? He creates a new heavens and a new earth with a new Jerusalem where we will dwell with him for eternity, where righteousness fills this land. So Jesus not only created all things, but he's holding them together. You know, people struggle in, in marriages or their jobs or relationships. Why? Because Jesus isn't holding them together. In marriage, he has to be the center of your marriage. You know, my wife and I, well, tomorrow will be 36 years, right? 36 years. I, I can't even believe it. But, you know, when you're married at 10, time does fly by. And All right, maybe I was a little older. So 18. 18, no. 19? I don't know how old I was. I'm too old to remember. I was old. No, I wasn't that old. I was 20, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm 56. Yeah, do the math. <laughs> well, that kind of goes with the guy who was mad at me because I wasn't smarter than him. So, yeah, you know, that kind of fits in there. But isn't it incredible? But I'll tell you what, the thing that holds our marriage together is Jesus. Because you know what? I have my ideas, my ways, my pride, and so does Julie. And if you try and put those two things together, they're like a bunch of tablespoon of protons and pushing us apart, right? But you know what? Jesus holds it together. He's the one that holds marriages, relationships, jobs, all these things together. You want a stable life. I'm not saying an easy life, but one that's stable. Keep Jesus in the center because he holds us together. Just like he holds this entire universe together. And when we move away from the word of God, when we take Jesus out of our lives, our lives tend to fall apart. And I think that's an important lesson. So Jesus is superior to the prophets. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, as I bring this study to a close, we've seen that Jesus is superior to the prophets because he is heir of all things. He made the worlds. He's the brightness of his glory. He's the express image of his person, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. And next time we'll finish up looking at the rest of this description of Jesus, again, showing that he's superior to the prophets. We need to listen to him. I'll close with this. The author of Hebrews begins his presentation with a straightforward, no-holds-barred announcement of his letter's subject, which is a theological declaration of supremacy of the Messiah. The first three verses of chapter 1 serve as the author's opening salvo in his confirmation to Jesus' definitive supremacy, which is revealed in both his person and his priesthood. While the opening statement provides only the briefest of introductions to the idea of Jesus' priesthood, a subject that will be developed at length further along in the epistle, it nonetheless sets forth an unparalleled series of seven assertions that extols an incomparable person. The initial focus is on Jesus' identity as God's final and finest revelation. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is superior to all, and we need to listen to him. We need to obey his words in these days we're living in because there is such confusion out there regarding Jesus and what he wants in our lives. And yet it's really simple. He's given us his word, his love letter to us from Genesis to Revelation, telling us how we are to live, what we are to do. And if we follow him, do you think he's going to lead us astray? Do you think he's going to tell us to do something that's going to hurt us? Absolutely not. The devil's come to destroy lives. And look at how often he does it. Oh, it's just one pornographic sight. Don't worry, it won't hurt you. Oh, it's just one look. You can look, just don't touch. You've heard that before. It's not really cheating. Well, then what is it? And we could go on and on. 
Because the devil wants to destroy your life. Jesus, I want to give you life, and I want to give it to you more abundantly. But we have to obey him. We have to follow him. I'm not saying it's always easy. But he, he will lead us all the days of our life. We just need to look to him. We need to listen to him. Because God, in these last days, has spoken to us through his son. Pay attention to what he's saying. Be in his word. Listen to what he's telling you. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord, and just how powerful just these first three verses are showing us who Jesus is. And it just continues on and it builds through the book of Hebrews. And Lord, we just pray, help us to understand that, that Jesus is Almighty God. And for those that don't believe, Lord, I just pray, open their eyes, soften their heart, that they can come to saving faith. Lord, we love you. And we just pray uh, for the men and women who are serving our country on this Memorial Day, Lord, that we remember the sacrifices that were made by men and women throughout the years, the thousands of lives who have been lost to give us the freedom we have. And we thank these men and women, Lord, and those that are serving today. Bless them, their families, Lord. And Lord, just uh, for those that don't know you, open their eyes. They come to saving faith. In Jesus' name, amen.